Welcome to the interview. I'm Ciara Pressler. This is where I interview some of my favorite creators, innovators, game changers, people who are not just talking about ideas, but doing them right now to inspire you, motivate you, and to build your network. Um, today here at Pregame in our live Zoom studio clubhouse, um, I'm very excited to welcome Sylvia Salazar. She is the founder of Tono Latino. We're going to hear all about uh, the journey to creating it and her story today. Welcome, Sylvia. Thank you. I'm so excited. I know we're new friends. And so um, I'm going to be asking you some questions as well so I can get to know you. But um, just to let everybody know some of your background, um, you're a Colombian immigrant. You are a computer engineer turned political activist. And your passion is helping other people what, understand what's going on in the world of politics and to encourage us to become more politically involved and to vote, which is also um, a huge passion of mine. So um, I have to ask because uh, we're filming this on August 21st, 2020. Did you watch the Democratic National Convention this week? And what did you think? I have watched pieces. I have not watched 100% of it because it was too much for me. Like I have to guard my emotions. And so I watched the entire day three and it was, it, there were so many emotions that I can still feel. I mean, I was literally crying one minute and then dancing another minute and then cry, screaming with like women power another minute and then crying again. And then I was exhausted. I would feel like somebody connected a vacuum to my heart and just like sucked all the energy out of me. So I've been watching it like in little by little because I, I, it's too many emotions and I have to guard myself. Um, I learned that lesson <clears throat> earlier this year, right when the Black Lives Matter protests began, it became so overwhelming with the emotional, the mental, um, just burden of it all that I had to take a break. <clears throat> I was like, I couldn't stop crying every day. And it was just so much that I had to put a pause and take a 10 day break. And it's the first time I take a break in three years that everybody's like, wait, Sylvia's on vacation from Tono Latino. What? Like you seriously? And I said, and I did not watch news. I did not check social media. Like I was off the grid for 10 days. Nobody could believe it. And then I realized how much things would upset me. And so if I accidentally, because some people didn't know that I was off the grid because they couldn't believe it, uh, or they just hadn't seen my announcement, whenever I saw or I was exposed to a headline, I could literally feel the rage just shoot up. And it made me realize, I'm like, oh my God, I am exposed to this all day, every day. And I'm at this level rage. And if something infuriates me, it's because it just really, really pushed me up. So now I'm being extra conscious of how I expose myself to things. And so that's why I'm like, let's, let's take the DNC in little chunks. Because back to me as a computer engineer, this is like the consumer electronics show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the political version of it. And I, I used to go to CES uh, when I worked uh, in tech. And it was literally a week in Las Vegas of just technology. And you're like physically exhausted because you're on your feet all day, walking miles and miles and miles and miles uh, and talking to people. So it's very just also physically and just emotionally exhausting to be putting out energy all day long. And this is a little bit of the same, but the difference is that the rest of the world just keeps going and there's still news. So even if we have the DNC going on every night, there were some huge headlines this week. So I was like, okay, how do you balance it all? And then I have a daughter. And so it's like, ah, so I've watched some things. I watched Michelle Obama's speech. I watched, and of course, President Obama spoke on night three. And I, I watched Biden yesterday. And the other thing, personally, I don't like watching most things at 1x speed. It just, I watch things at like 1.2. 1.2 is like a very good sweet spot for most people. 
there's some people that need a 1.5. They're just <laughs> well, I felt very... a lot of the speeches were, were especially slow because people were really making their points and letting them stick in, but people who normally speak very quickly, um, I noticed were speaking very slowly in all of their presentations. Yes. So Biden's speech at 1.25x, perfect. It's a perfect <laughs> speech. It's still slow and well paced, but it's not so slow that you're like, okay, I don't know if it's like the Colombian in me that I'm just like, okay, let's, let's, let's speed things up. Let's put a little energy in here. <laughs> I love it. Um, so what is your normal news diet? Because so much of what you do with Tono Latino is to take all the news of the day, all the news of the week and distill it down to sort of an explainer, which I really appreciate because a lot of times if you jump into a news story in like the New York Times or NPR, um, you know, you're kind of in the middle of it and you may not know the context and the background, but you do such a wonderful job of distilling uh, the news down to its essential uh, components and why it matters. Um, what is your normal news diet, news intake to get your information? I combine a lot of different things. And the funny thing is that I think that what you just described comes from my career in tech where I, uh, I was a technical marketing engineer. So I would have to understand complex technologies and explain them to either the customer or our sales and marketing field in terms that they could understand. And it was always like the perfect example was my mother who was totally just, she does not embrace technology which is funny because she has a, she had a husband who was an engineer and a daughter who's an engineer. And I would always think I'm like, how would I explain this technology to my mother so that she gets it? And now I kind of do the same thing, but with politics and I've had to catch up because I didn't grow up in the United States. So I never learned anything about the U S government and I've been playing catch up, especially the last few years. I prefer <clears throat> newsletters and podcasts. And then I do watch a little bit on TV, but not that much. So I sign up for literally dozens of newsletters. I have New York Times, Washington Post, NPR, Vox. There's a historian, university professor. Her name is Heather Cox Richards, I think. She does one of the best newsletters I have seen because she adds the historical context. Um, and then tons of different podcasts. Oh, and another one from Crooked Media, uh, podcasts from Crooked Media, from the New York Times, the Daily, from NPR, Rachel Maddow. So I just combine all of that. And then I'm like, okay, what are the pieces that are super important? And how do we explain this for people? And I always, the one thing that I always try to do is not just give you the information, but also whenever possible, as much as possible, tell people what they can do about it. Because I think it's very frustrating to just hear, oh, there's this going on and this going on and this going on. It's like, okay, yeah, but I'm feeling overwhelmed and I can't do anything. And it's like, no, one of the beautiful things about the United States is that there's so many things that civilians can do, regular citizens and even non-citizens. Um, for example, in my house, I'm a citizen, but my husband is not. That doesn't mean that I don't drag him to every protest that we can go to. He can protest. So I that's, that. that's yeah, kind of the so, thing. It's so important because it's easy to get overwhelmed. And um, I remember, gosh, I think it was when I went to the DNC in 2008, I went to the Democratic National Convention in Denver, which was absolutely magical because it's when Obama got the nomination and I, I just get chills still remembering it and I was talking to um, you know he was an activist but I think a big donor in Queens New York because I went with the New York delegation and and he talked about the importance of like to be effective in politics to pick a specific cause and really just work on that one cause and while I think it's important, it's impossible really to do that. Um, I appreciate the point of like to feel a sense of progress and and to take action. It's good to focus in because when you look at the whole scope of all the news that's happening, it is overwhelming, and you do get that emotional shutdown. And if you're um, a person who feels empathy, you know, you hear something that's happening. George Floyd being an obvious example of the year it's just heartbreaking. And then, you know, you feel so powerless to do anything. And I do think it's 
vital that we don't get into that place of powerlessness and stay there. I think we need to have a sense of awareness, uh, just like you said, to handle our emotion, especially for very empathetic people. Some of these things can really overwhelm you. And then also, because everything is at, going on at the same time, you're like, I can't even start. Then you just like throw your hands up and it's like, I can't do anything. But what you said, and it's the same as like tackling a big project, you break it down into pieces and you handle the one piece and you make the little micro goals and let's just focus on this. The rest is chaos, but let's focus on this one thing and you know, we can accomplish something small and then something a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. We all have like these ideas that we want to do this humongous thing. And it's like, dude, nobody can do that. <laughs> we, we need to focus on one, set, one specific thing and just keep going and build momentum on that. That's a great solution to, to feel like, you know, to counterbalance that sense of powerlessness or despair even that people will sink into. Um, so I want to take it back and give people some, some context about you and your journey. So you are an immigrant. You are mm -hmm. <laughs> what's being talked about, you know, in various ways by both sides right now, but you're from Colombia. I don't know a lot about, um, Colombia government, but tell us a little bit about your growing up and, and what brought you to the U.S. So I've been, what is it, this term called? Like third country children, I think. Uh, so I grew up, I was born in Colombia and I stayed there until I was almost nine years old. And then we moved to Ecuador. So my immigrant journey began at almost nine years of age when we moved to Ecuador, country next door, but it was very like a completely different situation for us. And we lived there for six years. So, and they were the best six years of my childhood but then it was also the six years where you're always the non-local you are always yeah the the tourist the immigrant then we returned to colombia but i was a an a tourist or an immigrant in my own country because i grew up in ecuador oh wow those six years and I came back and I had a different accent and I couldn't relate to any of the things that my classmates would talk about. Like I hadn't seen the same TV shows or the same anything. Like I had no idea what they were talking about the first few months. Like I, it was like playing catch up. And then four years later, I graduated high school and my family this whole, this entire time had been applying for a visa and we used Shane migration. So my, my mother's sister requested us and it took 14 years yeah. for that to happen. And it all kind of aligned when I was graduating high school. So as I was graduating high school, it's the whole college inquiry. My parents told me not to look into colleges in Colombia. And so we started the process of looking at college and that's, colleges in the US, but that wasn't normal for my school. So then I had to go to like another school college fair. And it was super weird because all of those kids had uniform for their school. And here's, here I'm at, here I am in regular clothes because I wouldn't go into their school with my uniform to try to talk to the college recruiters and learn more about the colleges here that we're visiting. And so I applied and I got into University of Miami. And it was great because the only big, like the biggest thing in terms of change and culture was more like the weather from, I'm from Bogota, which is almost 9,000 feet above the ocean. So it's kind of like a Portland <laughs> in the fall kind of weather with trees and stuff. We don't have Caribbean heat or anything. So moving to Miami was quite a change for me. Yeah. Like, oh my God. But it was still very, very close to Colombia. So much so that at the supermarket, you can buy all the Colombian products, like same cheese, same orange juice, same brands, like everything. Like you don't feel so far. And then after college, 
my parents had moved to California, so I went to live with them and then I got hired here at Intel. I didn't know where Oregon was. Yeah, no. <laughs> They're like, we want to invite you. And I was like, let me look that up in a map. And I was like, oh, it's like right here. Um, the only Portland I had heard of was Portland, Maine, because my first roommate in college was from Portland, Maine. And so I looked it up in a map and I was like, oh, it's up here. And I'm like, literally, I am crossing the country from like one corner to the other. And it was the first time that I really experienced culture shock in the United States when I moved to Oregon. Because there were like, especially like Florida, California, there's a lot of Latinos. And then <laughs> come to <laughs> Oregon in 2004. And it's like, uh, I, I, I didn't find any Latinos. There was like nobody that spoke Spanish. Uh, I just saw... I don't know. It was very strange. Yeah, so and it I have was a question. So, you know, there companies are talking so much about diversity right now. And um, part of the criticism of that, especially in the Portland area is, well, you might recruit people, but you don't create a home for people so they don't stay. And I'm curious if with your, if you don't mind sharing your experience with Intel, do they go to any measures to make people coming from around the world feel comfortable out in Hill? I mean, and for people who don't know, Intel is not in Portland. It's not in the city. It's in Hillsboro, which is like a suburb of a suburb. It really depends on which team you land in. Intel is so, so, so big that it's like a whole city. I mean, Intel Corporation has over 100,000 employees. Obviously not all of them in Oregon, but even though the headquarters are in Silicon Valley, the biggest site in the world is in Oregon. It employs, the numbers that I remember, I could be wrong, over 20,000 people. But also all of the surrounding businesses support mm -hmm. Intel. So indirectly it employs thousands and thousands and thousands more people. You are correct. They do a lot of effort to try to bring diversity candidates in, but there's a lot of extra work that needs to happen. And I'm going to say, I think a lot of people have the right intentions. They just don't know how to execute. And so they miss how to make certain individuals feel at home and feel like they can connect. Um, and from my experience, <clears throat> like in my group, there, I, there was no, no connection with anybody. So that was really hard. And it is even harder if we bring some intersectionality into it when you're Latino, but you're also a woman and you're the only woman on the team. You're the only Latina on the team. So you're like two. Yeah separate things you're the so it just it's very hard to connect um and i well, think that you know the criticism and i think there's another level to it as well where you know the criticism um of like nike right now is you know you bring people from all over the united states so maybe you're recruiting diverse candidates in race for mm -hmm. example um but then they get to beaverton which is the the area between Hillsborough and Portland. Um, and then they don't feel a sense of like, there's no black community here or something like that. Well, at Intel, you're getting people more recruited from around the world. So not only are people coming from a whole other country, you're also stuck there because Intel owns your visa. So it's not like you could change jobs to somewhere else around here. Um, but it's so interesting, I say to friends who visit, you know, Portland, feels very white and is very white, depending on which part of Portland you're in. But as you move into the suburbs, into Beaverton and Hillsboro, you see a lot more diversity because of all the people who work for Nike and Intel. Yes. The thing about Intel is that a lot of those uh, international hires are most, like a big, big, big portion of them come from India because they're highly right. yes. technical but there's not a lot of Latin Americans. Yeah. 
uh, black employees are usually from Africa because yes. they're very uh, highly technical. They have PhDs or advanced technical master's degrees. And so they are recruited and that's the diversity you will see. Mm. When I was at Intel, there was a, an amazing program that I was a part of in, I was part of it in 2012. It had been implemented a number of years prior. It had started a number of years before and it kept going. And unfortunately it shut down. It was specifically designed. It was a nine month program. Like it took me longer to make my child than this. I mean, or it took me longer to be here than it took me to make my child. It was designed specifically to help black and um, Latino employees understand more about the culture of corporate America and how to navigate and find connection with people that were raised in similar ways as you. And it was an amazing program that did help retention. Oh, but unfortunately, okay. due to cost cutting, it was eliminated, yeah. which to me is a bummer, but it was one of the best training programs I have ever attended. The person that she was an external contractor, like that Intel hired, her name is Trudy Bourgeois. She is the founder of the Center for Workforce Excellence. She was, I believe she was a VP for Philip Morris many, 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 many years ago. She is this tiny, petite little black woman <laughs> that is a firecracker. You, I mean, I fell in love with her after 25 minutes of her talking and I was just like, whatever this woman does, I will follow. Like, yeah, <laughs> I love that. And that was one of my best experiences at Intel. But it's encouraging. Yeah, but now it's cut. <laughs> Maybe they'll bring it back. And I know they do have like an entire diversity and inclusion organization and things like that. But many times it's, I think it's part of a checklist. Well, yeah, I mean, they made a donation, you know, in the wake of George Floyd um, of $1 million to social activists uh, to, to the cause, basically. Um, and, you know, I had a friend who very wisely pointed out that like, for Intel, $1 million is like a rounding error, you know, <laughs> like, a, a, it's not, it's just a gesture. It's, it wasn't thoughtful or deep and it wasn't about systemic change in the organization or in their influence in, in the tech community. And we all know tech skews very like white, straight, young male. So they did have one thing that I was, cause my husband still works at Intel they had a series of meetings and webinars and trainings and discussions right after that were, I mean, I obviously didn't attend them because I don't work there, but were very good. So it wasn't just giving the money. They were, they were having discussions and they were giving employees spaces to talk and hopefully coming together to create some, not just awareness, but, but program solutions to improve, to make things better. That's encouraging. I, I, you know, it's American culture. I don't know if you found this is so um, all about like quick fixes and, and putting band-aids on the problem. And, and, you know, of course, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion are very like long-term processes. And, and so let's hope that people are truly in it for the long run. Um, well, I want to get I back. I think to we just photo. need to keep reminding people. It's like, no, no, no. Yeah. This is still a conversation. This is still happening. We're like, we're not going to let this go. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of the accountability pieces. If you have a groundswell of people, who are demanding accountability, that's what makes the difference. So um, getting back to Tono Latino, what made you leave Intel <laughs> and leave being an engineer to start? Um, what, you know, you could phrase it as a tech startup, a media venture. 
So I didn't leave Intel for this, oddly okay. enough. I left Intel for other personal reasons. It was just, I, I, it, there was a lot of misalignment. And unfortunately, when I had, when I was on maternity leave, there were some reorganizational, there, there was a reorg and my job did not exist anymore. And th there was nothing for me to come back to. Unfortunately, back to the whole technical female Latina. It could be a double-edged sword because you give groups, let's call them good points with HR. <laughs> yes. So groups do not want to lose these underrepresented minorities because then it looks bad in their HR card. Mm -hmm. So not only, I mean, I found jobs that I wanted to do, but I wasn't allowed to go do them because my team wouldn't let, they would not, they were not willing to lose the percentage of Latinos and percentage of technical females in the organization. Wow, and so I was yeah. trapped. It was a very unfortunate thing. And then I was just, I reached a point where I was absolutely miserable, crying in my car for 15 minutes right before going into the office every morning. And I was like, I just, Intel had been the love of my life for 11 years. And I was like, I can't, I can't keep doing this. Like, this is a, this is a bad relationship. And I cannot get to a point where I hate Intel because my husband still works there and most of my friends still work there. So I had to make a decision and I left. Um, and I joined like a, a small group trying to do marketing consulting. And I did it for a few months until kind of I automated my job. And so there was nothing <laughs> really where I could contribute because I love problem solving. And so once I saw the problem, like let's, let's find another one and let's find another one. Let's keep finding solutions. And so I transitioned out of that. And then I was like, okay, what, what do I need to do? Fast forward the election. <laughs> I was not expecting of what 2016? happened. Yeah. So I was completely blindsided. Yes, we all were. <laughs> <laughs> I have, you know, the movie inside out with the little, yeah memory memory balls so, so i do have a core memory of my friend christina in my kitchen i never remember what anybody's wearing or what i'm wearing but i have this memory like tattooed into my brain <laughs> christina sitting in front of me with the white blouse with like this beautiful lace it was like sunset and she was telling me that this person was gonna win and i was like no 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 christina the people of the United States are never going to let this happen. What are you talking about? And I just got like super animated and passionate. I was like, this is never going to happen. And I dismissed it. This moment <laughs> replays in my head. And I went through, I don't know by memory, the stages of grief or anything. I do know that it was the one of only two times in my life that I have woken up in the middle of the night thinking, this didn't happen. This is a nightmare. And the only other time that ever happened to me was <clears throat> during my pregnancy when we had a, like a, a scare with, with my daughter. And this time I was like, no, 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 this, this didn't happen. And no, Sylvia, it did. I had to see my therapist the next day. Thank <laughs> God. It was the only thing that got me out of bed to go see my therapist. And I just, I, I don't even know if I talked. I just sat there in shock. Like, and then I got sick. Like my body just, the de like our, my defenses just went down and I was sick Me for a week. Yeah. Me too. I got sick on the Thursday. Election night was Tuesday. I had, I got walking pneumonia. Uh, and yeah. then I went through the whole fog denial. And then I'm like, the engineer came back and I'm like, okay, how are we going to fix this? Mm. What are we going to do? Let's get to work. And so I started going online and doing research and learning, 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 learning. And I found out, for example, that the Latino voter turnout sucks. Like for the past six presidential elections, not counting this one, our voter turnout has been consistently below 50%. And I'm like, why do you no, think no, no, that no. Is? Why, why is that? There's a number of different Things. So this is not a one 
this situation is not, it's not happening just because of one particular thing. A lot, let's, let's break down some of them. One is just voter suppression. A lot of the Latinos in the U.S. Um, work in jobs that they can't just take some Tuesday off. As an immigrant, I will never understand this. Tuesday off to go vote. You won't understand this because do you have election day off in Colombia? Election day in Colombia is on a Sunday. Oh, okay. And there are rules, like there's even... Do you have that here? I don't think so. That you can't buy any alcohol since... No, we right. don't have that. <laughs> Saturday and Sunday, there's no alcohol during that weekend. Like if, if you're going to drink, you need to do it at home, but there's no alcohol consumption. Uh, people are automatically registered to vote in Colombia. So I know we have other issues with elections. Ah, as yeah. soon as you are a citizen and you turn 18, you're automatically registered. You might not be automatically registered to vote at your preferred polling place, but you are automatically registered to vote. That's a great point. And something I've never questioned is why wouldn't, you know, there's no reason if you want everybody to vote, not to automatically register people. So Which some places have started to do with like driver's licenses, but there's really no reason not to register everybody automatically. Who's this? Exactly. So like I was saying, Latinos will have jobs that don't allow them to just take off. Uh, we know there's, places in this country where people have to stand for hours and hours and hours. I'm sorry, but even if you had permission from your job to go vote, if you have kids, you can't be standing in line. What is going to happen with your kids as a mom? Like, what is this? The Iowa caucus to me is absolutely crazy. Like <laughs> the caucus a, a single mom or so strange. Yeah. somebody that, um, is elderly or can't stand and just move around. Like, I'm sorry, but this is discriminatory to certain people with disabilities, people that need help with children. Like, it's insane. It's archaic, archaic. We have so many options here. And perhaps it's the fact that I've been spoiled to death and the only place where I have voted in the United States and actually in the world, because I was never able to vote in Colombia, is here in Oregon. And the whole vote by mail thing is amazing. Yeah, so people who aren't from Oregon, um, we've, we have only vote by mail for many years. So that's been the only way that Oregon votes. So, you know, our Senator Wyden was really pushing for vote by mail, you know, at the federal level, making the point that it's fine. We've been doing it. <laughs> Five states in this country always automatically vote by mail. Oregon, Washington, Utah, Colorado, and Hawaii. And for this election, there's going to be even more states implementing that, where, for example, California, if you are registered to vote, you're going to automatically receive your ballot, your absentee ballot over the mail so that you don't expose yourself. The difference is that in California, if you do want to vote in person, you can do that. In Oregon, that is not an option. So back to the Tono Latino, I saw that. And then I also went to my first protest, the, the Women's March. Yes. My husband was out of town and I had a one-year-old baby. So I found a babysitter and I went by myself. And I remember I was driving and I was so scared because I'm an introvert and crowds freak me out. So you I are not an introvert. I don't believe you. <laughs> I, like, I swear to you. I, I can do, I do okay in like one-on-one, -on -one, but crowds, just like okay. I have to, well, I'm an ambivert, so I can... <laughs> do well but then i have to i need my recharge time i need my alone no noise just completely blocked off times and the idea of a protest downtown with thousands of people just freaked me out and i was just crying and crying and crying i didn't know where to park i parked super far away <laughs> from the waterfront and i went there and i think somebody from above was just watching for me because of all the thousands of people, I bumped into a friend of mine who was also by herself. Oh my goodness. And I'm like, okay, what are the, cause I didn't bump into anybody else. I was trying to meet up with people and it was impossible. And I literally turned and I see Sandy in front of me and I was like, Sandy, 
Mm -hmm. Hi. And then we hung out because we never got to March because they were expecting 20, 30,000 people and there were 70 to 100,000 people. So we never actually moved anywhere. I think we moved in like a five meter <laughs> square. And then I got to pay more attention. It was very invigorating. But also I noticed all these organizations move on, indivisible, blah, blah, blah. Who's talking to Latinos? <laughs> Where are the Latinos? No. There was only Voto Latino, which is a great organization founded over 10 years ago by another Colombian woman. They focus on Latino voter registration, specifically like millennials and Gen Zs. And that's great, but I'm like, okay, what about the information? And so I start digging and this is, and, and I realize I'm like, wait, we need more, we need to inform Latinos even more. I know one of the issues is voter suppression. Another one of the issues is voter registration. They're not registered to vote. They don't know how to vote. But also they don't know what's, they don't understand what's happening and they don't understand how this affects them. And many of us come from Latin America and many, 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 many just have no trust for the government. They don't trust elections. They're just like, there's no point. It's just going to be. It's rigged. corrupt anyway. So why? Yeah. So why do I bother? Especially why would I take a day off from work and not receive my income mm -hmm. <laughs> to go do something that's not going to help me? So there's that okay. mentality of just like, it doesn't matter. There's no point. There's no point. There's no point. Uh, also, back to the diversity and representation, Latinos make nearly 18% of the U.S. population. We have 1% of Latino elected officials in this country. If you can't connect, and, it, and I'm not saying all politicians are bad, but I'm sure white guy Joe doesn't understand what Maria, the Latina entrepreneur who has her own small business needs. And it's not because he's a bad man, it's because he just doesn't understand her situation. And so we need more of our people to represent us. And it, it, there's just like so many layers. Also, I had already started Tono Latino and prior to the 2018 midterms, I was just dumbfounded to see an article from the New York, New York Times that shared that there's a, an organization called Latino Decisions and they polled Latinos nationwide to see if anybody had contacted them prior to the midterms. Over 50% of them said nobody, nobody, no campaign had talked to them, not by phone, email, person, smoke signal, nothing. So why would you go participate in something that clearly nobody wants you there, right? How are they gonna know and understand what the election is about or what the, uh, people running or about if nobody has bothered to even come and tell you. So if you ignore them all the time, well, they're going to ignore you back. And the other mistake is that the number, what is the number one issue that people think about when you say Latinos? The one thing that people go and talk to Latinos about is always immigration. It's like, yes, it's a very important topic, of course. But if you think about it, if I can vote, immigration doesn't directly affect me. You know what directly affects me? Infrastructure, tax reform, healthcare, education. Why aren't you covering these topics as well? Like affordable healthcare. Education for my kids. But not only are they getting ignored, they don't hear about other topics that they're interested in. So. There's a tone deafness amongst the leadership in the parties and in these organizing uh, uh, organizations that, um, well, A, that Latinos are a monolith, right? Like that everyone from every <laughs> Latin American country cares about the same thing, which is not true. And that immigration is the number one topic, but if somebody is in the immigration process, they can't vote anyway. Yeah. and. Ah. And the whole 
just put a Spanish speaker on top of a regular ad, that doesn't work. Not nuanced, no. <laughs> and that's why whether you like him or you don't like him, you can't argue that Bernie Sanders didn't do a fantastic job with the Latino community because he was actually doing things to connect with the community, organizing things like, like our football with the round ball tournaments, not like an American barbecue kind of thing, but it was like tacos con Tio Bernie. <laughs> so it was more of a let's connect with the community with the things that they care about versus me pushing things on you. So we need more of that. Yeah. Yeah. I really, um, <laughs> it reminds me of the, the threat in the 2016 election of taco trucks on every corner. And I just thought, I want to live in that place. Where is that place? <laughs> <laughs> taco Tuesday, tacos every day. Yeah. Yeah. Every damn day. Um, so, so I think, you know, for me, uh, um, you know, I'm somebody who's black and white and, uh, you know, there's a lot of inter other intersections in my life. And so I pay attention to issues facing, um, you know, I pay more attention to issues facing black Americans right now. And especially that's the dominant conversation about diversity right now. But I know that it's also very important that I pay attention to issues that affect other groups because it's all connected. So what is your message to maybe white Americans or Americans who identify, who don't identify as Latino, why they should also support um, their Latino brothers and sisters in the US? That's, I love your question. As a clearly white Latina, I want to be, and I don't want to say Trojan horse in a bad way, but we know that some people will relate better to someone if they look like them. Hey, I so hear you. <laughs> if this Casper colored Latina <laughs> can present to them, like, look, this group of people is going through these things this is what we can do. And also because I need to do what I can with my white privilege to take the burden off of my Latino friends that have darker skin and are getting harassed. They don't need to deal with the education of people. They're dealing with enough problems right now that I don't deal with because of the way I look. Mm, I identify with you so much in that. And yeah. so that just energizes me to be like, no, 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 I'm going to fight for them. They're dealing with enough crap right now and they just need to protect themselves. And I will help in any way I can. And I know that I can connect with white people because I look closer to them. And so many of them are like, but you're too, what, you're too white to be Latina. And I'm like, I actually look very Colombian if I showed you what Colombian people look like. And I can dance like a Colombian. Um, <laughs> just put some music on and let's boogie. But just I can create that connection and just use my platform for that. So I can connect with both. And one of the things that I did that is kind of, some people find it weird is, okay, but you're called Tono Latino. You, you were doing stuff in Spanish, now you're doing it in English. Like, what's up with that? It's like, well, let's start with education point number one. Latino doesn't mean Spanish speaker. Mm. Let's start with there. And then two, because of my target audience or like who I'm trying to reach is the younger Latinos. English is their, the language that they use and that they search and that they consume digital content in but if i just swing in a few little phrases or something or i just say hola mi gente linda they know by my accent immediately that i speak spanish and i'll just throw in a little a little phrase here and there in spanish and i can create that rapport and they know that i'm one of them that i understand like culturally waking up on saturday morning with your mom, mom blasting music and trying to kick you out of your room because she's sweeping <laughs> or vacuuming and like we we understand each other at that level 
So I think it helps. I think it helps. And I, I do take it as my responsibility. I'm like, I'm going to do everything I can to help just create awareness and inform more people. And so we're coming up on, <laughs> you've got your sign 74 days of campaigning and we're going to have to be careful protecting our energy uh, with all the news flying at us. And I'm sure it's going to get ugly uh, in the next 74 days between uh, this contest. And also, you know, we're going to see, uh, it'll be interesting to see how the right attacks Kamala as a woman of color. Um, what is your message to voters and non-voters or people who might be thinking, I don't even want to get involved? What's your message to Americans? Uh, for the next 74 days. Oh, I have this on my bio and my Instagram and my bio, everything else. Even if you don't vote, you're still saying something. So your silence is still saying a lot. Like I said at the beginning of our conversation, it doesn't matter if you're not a citizen, you're still here and what happens still affects you. Mm -hmm. And there's a ton of things you can do to help democracy. You can write letters to voters in key states. Sign up at voteforward.org. Um, there's a number of different, some you need to be a citizen. Some you don't need to be a citizen. Like I said, well, my husband- This is a big one. For the love of God, fill out the census. This is going to affect how much money your region gets for uh, important things like hospitals and schools and roads and everything else and the representation that we get in Congress. And we need people in Congress to represent who we are. We don't need people in Congress that don't look like the communities that they represent. Um, so there's a lot of things that people can do, even if they're not citizens. So staying still is not an option. This is basically what I'm saying. No, no, no. You will do something. The least you can do is vote. And if you want to do more, I have a million different suggestions for you to help. How can people follow you, get in touch, and keep hearing what you suggest that we all do? So you can visit my website, tonolatino.com, or you can follow me. Instagram is like the place where I'm most active, tono.latino, or you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. I just hit a thousand subscribers yesterday. I'm ah, so excited. Congrats. Yeah. Uh, where I put more like educational pieces, like what is gerrymandering or how do we write letters to voters in key states, things like that. Every week I have a new video up. And I did a video on Kamala Harris this week. I loved it. I think your videos, you know, they're so um, informative and digestible. You know, I just, I think you're doing a great job. The production value is perfect for um, being able to understand this information quickly. And, and it's entertaining um, without being too cute. You know, I just- Did I you see that I have an assistant? Yes, uh, I love she, char that she charges me now. So my <laughs> five-year-old daughter says she's gonna help me with my videos. She does help. She does side hand gestures of like thumbs up or thumbs down, depending on the topic. Like yeah. But now she charges me. And <laughs> I had to, like she said, mama, can I get some coins if I help you? And I first said, no, I, I'm sorry, but I can't. And then I said, no, 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 no. This is a woman that's advocating for her work. And I said, you know what? Actually, I'm very proud of you for saying that. Yes, I am going to pay you some coins. She measures everything in coins. <laughs> so I'm like, I am going to pay you some coins if you help me. I like And I have to pay. Yes, I like it. Well, perfect. Thank you so much for your time. I'm excited to see the content you come out with over the next 74 days and beyond. Um, and everybody vote, get involved, do something very small. It really can have a big impact. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. This was fun. <laughs> uh, 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 I spit it cold like